huge proponent of technology and, and sees, saw and sees technology as an opportunity for both a competitive advantage for students in the market. Uh, so students who know how to work with technology are people that law firms may be more willing to hire more quickly, but also as a potential uh, help uh, with the access to justice problem. Um, there's a very strong element uh, she believes in that. <clears throat> so when I got there uh, the following uh, spring, um, I, I initiated a conversation about using A to J author. Oops, I don't have an A to J author. My slide came up, but that's all right. Uh, a to J author as a mechanism <coughs> for trying to show what teaching technology might look like. Um, you don't have to be an A to J author fellow. You don't have to be part of the A to J author uh, group. Anybody can go in and download A to J author and start using it. And so I happen to be at a library uh, that or I happen to be in a county where there is no public law library. So 70% of our traffic at our uh, front desk, or our, our main reference point, is pro se activity. Um, and so I was anxious uh, to help, uh, or to see if we could find a way to use HJ Author to put into place um, some mechanisms for some of the folks that are coming come through uh, at our reference point. Um, because we also know from the stats that we keep that roughly 60% of the people coming are looking for some kind of form or ha how to access a particular form. And this is A to J author's uh, particular strength. But UMKC also has an incubator program. And I'm just curious how many in the room are at schools where there is an incubator uh, in process? A couple, three, a few, okay. I mean, it's becoming a thing, right? So in 2009 there was one. Uh, now there's about 70. Um, and so the incubator offered another opportunity uh, because they wanted to create a community law clinic. Uh, so it would be a place that students could be and act as docents uh, to people trying to use the A to J author uh, programming. And so what I also did was find a law student who actually works for, or, or, who, <laughs> he was an interesting fellow, or is an interesting fellow. Um, he's a, he was a software engineer at Cerner. And if you don't know Cerner, it's one of the large medical, electronic medical records companies located in Kansas City. And he came to law school mainly to learn to be a subject matter expert. He had no intention of practicing law. He just wanted to build some programs or do something with software and, and wanted to do it in the law area. And so uh, Alan, the student, um, I got him, I showed him the A to J author. And so we commenced to work on um, a name change petition. Uh, because that actually happens to be the most requested, or was at the most requested form at that time. And in Missouri, there's three variations of the name change. Um, I'm sure this is a common thing in most states, actually. Um, <clears throat> but we started to, to construct it, and as I was building it out, I would hold, um, like every other month, a, fa a meeting where I invited faculty to look at the progress and what we were doing with the HJ author. Uh, so they could get a sense of what, a flavor of what technology teaching would be like. And so, <clears throat> unfortunately, when Alan graduated, I was not able to find another student who could quite so easily take on the A2J author. Um, I also had applied for the A2J author fellows program that was initiated, and I didn't get that. And then our accreditation was going to happen. And so a lot of things went to the wayside for a while uh, because my director at that point uh, actually became sick and so I was the interim director and so it was just a kind of a, things fell apart a little bit. So in 2014 though, um, or I should say in spring of 2013, I approached the curriculum committee about a proposal to teach a course based in part on what I showed them with A to J author <laughs> and I got a resounding no. Um, so I, I went back to the drawing board and I said, okay, here's another idea. Let's create a clinic for the clinics. So that is to say, let's create a technology clinic in which we would have students learning how to use technology, but then we would throw them at the other clinics to help those students initiate technology, but not have to put the burden on the clinic students to learn how to use the technology. And I thought this was like going to be an award winner, and that too was shot down. That was a resounding no to that idea. Um, now, all these things uh, um, takes time, but um, in 2014, we got some money from the Coffin Foundation, which happens to be located in, in Kansas City, and we ran um, two conferences that were called Law Schools, Technology, and Access to Justice, Access to Law and Justice. And we brought uh, to Kansas City uh, a large number of the legal technologists and the people who are big in the access to justice space, and we had a conversation about what does it mean to teach 
technology? What should we, we be doing? This, you can find this website. The link is here. Um, and then you'll see that we have, uh, we created a statement of fundamental principles um, regarding what should be involved with teaching technology. Um, these were crafted by people like Oliver Goodenough, Dan Katz, uh, Gabriel Tenenbaum, uh, Jonathan Askin, uh, several folks who are big in the te teaching technology in different areas. Um, they, we think they're a good starting point, and I point that out because if you're going to your curriculum committee, this is a useful thing, I think, to throw in as part of your package of materials that you might be presenting uh, to them. Um, so that happened in, um, the first conference was in July of 2014. And then that fall, we started our first, what I call, technology class. <coughs> and th it happened because Dean Suny, my, dean, my then dean, uh, Anth uh, Tony Lapino, another uh, professor who taught in the transactional law area, and myself, put together a course in which we partnered with MIT Media Lab to teach technology. And really it was law and technology, so we called it Law, Technology, and Public Policy. And we had a, um, uh, we had a partner uh, in the MIT Media Lab, um, Daza Greenwood, who is one of the first, um, he's a guy who works at MIT who is also a lawyer who's trying to do computational law. And his idea was that we would, we would bring the law students and he would bring the technologists. And we'd do this with Google Hangout, and we'd have problems being attacked, and it would be kind of like a semester-long hackathon. So uh, I'm sure mo most of you know about hackathons and legal hackathons. Um, but the idea was that instead of doing, uh, taking things, projects over a weekend, we take a full semester to run them through. So that was the concept. We put it together uh, in like two weeks and got it through um, the committee. It helps when the dean is a co-teacher. Uh, and so this time it was accepted. Um, and so we began the process. <clears throat> now, we also um, partnered with the Code for America Brigade in Kansas City. And as it turns out, the real technologists we were able to draw from for the class to help were the Code for America folks. The MIT folks, it worked out. We actually went, we actually, Kaufman gave us money to go to, to MIT in November. Uh, we held a weekend long hackathon. Uh, as part of the course. Um, we actually call it not a hackathon, we call it a prototype jam, uh, which is a novel way to describe um, bringing people into a room, look at a project, hack on it for the weekend, and then come back and look at it again. And so the students' grades were all tied to the final project that they submitted after the uh, prototype jam. Um, and we got a positive response. We had about 15 students in the first class. Uh, we had a connection then with the city. Uh, because we were doing city permits. We were helping them rethink city permitting processes. Um, so we, we had just a lot of synergy uh, developed around that. And so um, in the spring of 2015, um, we, we had another option for taking a whack at teaching law tech skills. And so I, I don't know how many schools have something like this, but we have a mini term. So one week, one credit hour uh, session. So it was suggested that we pilot the idea of a tech class in that one week mini term session. Um, and it actually worked out pretty well. Uh, so we offered it for the first time uh, in spring. Now it was more in the nature of a survey course. We didn't have a lot of hands on activity. We tried to show folks things, you know, because you can get like Clio and stuff like that to show folks. Um, I know Nikki and Stacey are going to talk more about that uh, relative to their class. Um, and so that had some additional success. And then we also continued the law schools technology uh, or law technology and public policy course uh, each subsequent semester, uh, building off of that. And then the, in the summer of 2015, we hosted the National Day of Civic Hacking for Kansas City, uh, for the Kansas City Brigade. And all the time we were doing this, we of course were keeping the faculty in the loop and explaining that this was bringing, to, bringing attention to us on a national level for being able to talk about what we were doing with the technology. And actually, uh, for that National Day of Civic Hacking, and for those of you who have participated, you know it's actually two days, Saturday and Sunday. I don't know why they call it the Day of Hacking, but at any rate, uh, we were ranked as one of the top seven events throughout the United States. And UMKC got some nice press as a result of that. Um, and so, in, let's see, so in this, the following spring of 2016, we offered the mini term again for the law practice technology skill, and we got another good response. This time we added a little bit of document assembly, so we showed them hot docs. We purchased um, licenses for 14 workstations in our lab for hot docs, 
and then set it up so there'd be some hands-on time as part of the part of the course. And then we hosted the National Day again, National Day of Civic Hacking again, continued with the Law, Technology, and Public Policy course. And then actually, I was also then in the second round of the A to J Author Fellows, and so I taught a course in the fall of 2015 which got approved because it had to be, because it was part of the deal with being an A to J author fellow, which made it a lot easier to sell to the faculty. Um, and so that was its own standalone course. And it, it was a great course. Um, and John, you walked in late, but I started out by saying when I got it to UMKC, the very first thing I did was show folks A to J author uh, as a way to try and get them interested in understanding how to teach technology. Because you don't have to be an A to J author um, fellow to be able to get access to that stuff. Um, and so in November of 2016, we went to the curriculum committee with our course, uh, Law Technology Skills. And it was finally approved uh, because we've been doing all of these things related to technology throughout that. Um, and so our first iteration of that was um, this spring, 2017, um, which we bifurcated into eight weeks of document assembly. And then uh, the balance was um, more, again, of the survey, where we had the different kinds of practice management tools explained. We brought in some guest speakers who showed how to use Facebook in this really interesting way for marketing um, and did a whole bunch of things. Um, and then we, this summer, are, we've now then split it into two courses. Uh, so I'm unfortunately leaving. I don't know what's going to happen to the second course. But Paul Collister, um, my uh, current director, is going to teach the document assembly course as a full semester. Uh, and then we have built a full semester uh, practice management uh, or law practice management skills uh, course that either Joshua Pluta, who are, is our newest librarian, will teach or may wait till they uh, replace me, which they're not going to do right away, unfortunately. So that's a long and tortured way to be able to get to having tech uh, in your uh, school. It's not a path for everybody, but my takeaway, I hope, from this is this idea that you can do little things to begin to show faculty how this might work. And I'm a huge fan of A to J author as one way to show how it works. And again, if you can find someone who has a background or a skill set with A to J or with programming, it's also helpful. Um, and it, it um, I see it still as a, a potential um, for our students uh, or for our uh, for our reference desk uh, with Pro Se. So I just a, a little takeaway from our from the syllabus from our course. We now, of course, like most places, have to have learning outcomes as part of the syllabus. And so one of the ones that I stuck in here is number four. At the end of this course, students will have developed a stronger skill set in statutory research. Uh, specifically, they will have more thorough understanding of researching municipal ordinance, ordinances and legislative process behind the creation of laws. Because half of our projects involved um, helping the city rethink some things like their permitting processes, right? But a lot of stuff is governed by the municipal code. And what happens is the code never gets pruned. And so there's a lot of stuff that's in the way. And so one of the reality checks, so, so the city would produce these information bulletins that would explain the process that were supposed to follow the law. And one of the things we had our students do was take the process and run it against the code and see if it actually was the same thing. And it turns out, not always. <laughs> there were things that got in the way, things that needed to be changed. So it was a, it was a way to teach legal research uh, secretly uh, that I thought was kind of a neat thing. Um, some of the projects we had, and we were, we were lucky because um, we had this really great relationship that we established with the city because they had a chief innovation officer whose sole task was to help make things more efficient <coughs> in, in the city. But we had a smart cities project uh, in which we were, uh, and uh, Kansas City is an open data um, city, and I think most cities are moving that direction. So that means that you can go to the data port and pull down all kinds of really interesting stuff uh, and then begin to manipulate it. And so we worked with the Code for America folks. We worked with the chief innovation officer uh, to work on that project. Another one, abandoned properties, which we think is a really cool thing, but Kansas City actually has a huge problem with abandoned properties. So one of the things we were building was, well, two things. We had a, what's called a zoning parcel assessment tool. The idea was to build an app that took the city data, and you could be standing anywhere and using geo uh, codes uh, be able to see the property that you're standing on and what it's zoned for, and then to create as part of that, what if we want to switch from commercial to residential or mixed use? And so uh, we worked in conjunction with um, 
And that was the other thing. This, is, this was interdisciplinary. And so we worked with um, Jim Delisle, Dr. Delisle from the Block Real Estate School, or Block Business School, their real estate uh, center, uh, to help build that out. So we had real estate students and law students working together. We got some computer science kids involved. We had the Code for America folks. And then we started building out um, a way to help the land bank, uh, which helps sell these vacant properties, to have their processing and their, per, their, their internal processes uh, streamlined and made accessible online. Um, so and these things tend to be multi-semester projects. Uh, the city permits API. So the idea was that um, the city, and John, you'll appreciate this, had purchased Tyler Technologies Entergov as the backbone for their uh, thing. And it was great for the back end, right? But uh, what wasn't getting done was the customer assistance portal that they <laughs> offer, right, the front end. And so the chief innovation officer wanted us to help think through how could that be designed, how could that look for the perm permitting processes generally, right? Because the standard thing is the classic um, problem we found was the plumber's dilemma. So you want to put a toilet in your house in Kansas City, you need five permits, five different permits. Oh, my God. But, and from five different agencies, all asking you the same questions about what you're doing, each collecting the information in a standalone kind of way, right? So as an information professional, that, of course, put my uh, hair on end, uh, but just generally as a citizen, it was like, why are we doing this? And, of course, we found out there's a cottage industry of permit application facilitators. helpers or facilitators, yeah, which I'm sure happens in every big city. Yep. Um, so that's, that was a terrific project to work with as well. Um, the other big one, then this is actually the other thing, is Professor Lapino, Tony Lapino is a fantastic guy, is an anti-technologist. Not in a bad way, he's just not a technology person. John knows Tony. Um, but having him in this course actually, <laughs> actually, he's trainable. He actually got him excited about technology. And one of the things that got him, and this is, this is what I'm uh, suggesting, is you find a faculty member who's got a cool idea about a paper thing. So his cool idea about a paper thing was he had a checklist that he would give out to his students when he taught business um, or transactional law. Uh, if you're going to start up a company, no matter the size of the company, here's the 50 things you need to talk about with your partner uh, to figure out, you know, what kind of a thing, what kind of an entity you're going to have. Who's got, who's got a stake in this? What happens if it falls apart? And so his was a handwritten checklist thing. And I said, you know, you could automate that thing. And so he said, interesting, how do we do that? So we called up Michael Mills at Neoto Logic, and Michael said, you know, that's a really cool idea. He said, what are you going to do with this? And Tony said, well, I want to give it away to the transactional law clinics around the United States. And Michael said, then we'll work with you for free, and we'll help you create that. And so that's another in with a faculty member, I think. If you can find something that they want to do that's really cool, but they don't know how to do it in an automated way, if you can bring together technologists and that professor like we did with uh, Tony, uh, there's an opportunity there. So uh, let's see. That's it. So my time is up, over time, sorry. Um, thank you. Uh, if you have questions, you can ask Stacy and Nikki. They'll be able to answer <laughs> them for you. Uh, and I, again, I apologize for thinking this was a Thursday thing, but thank you all very much. really good um, introduction to how you get people on board. I didn't have to do that. My dean actually said, mm, this is what I want you to do, and I want you to do it. I don't want anybody else to do it. So we were kind of tagged, you're it, and let's do it. Um, so basically what I want to talk to you about is just the one size is not fit all. Basically, there's just so much out there that you could incorporate and that you can utilize to develop your course. Um, so just kind of walking through and some of the decisions that you can make in developing your course. All right, so you're approved. What do you do now? <laughs> Crap. You know, you first, go back to your original proposal. At North Carolina Central, <coughs> you know, bless you, we don't have to uh, go through and develop the whole syllabus. We just do basic bullet points. We, we uh, go and do a basic lit review. This is why it is. So-and-so is utilizing it. 
So we go back to that original proposal and you want to start and flesh out the initial topics. And believe me, when you start to fl flesh out those initial topics, you're like, oh my god, what was I thinking? Like, you know, <laughs> right? Like, I can't do this, right? So, can the next question, the last question is, can you do that? Can you make it work? And believe me, there are some things that were in your initial proposal that you're going to just be like, hmm, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, because it's basically time consuming and is it really what your students need to learn about and provide them with a basic overview? and your initial, um, what your initial thoughts are for the course and developing and fitting, fitting them into what, it, what you want them to know. Okay, so the first thing that I always did is go back to who you are, all right? Go back to your mission. So my mission at North Carolina Central is I'm an HBCU. So how many of you have heard that terminology? Everybody should hear that mm -hmm. a historically black college or university. So our mission is going to be much different than uh, some other law schools. So our mission in small part says we, we, North Carolina Central is founded to provide opportunities for African Americans to become lawyers. So we provide personalized, practice-oriented, and affordable legal education to historically underrepresented students from diverse backgrounds. So when you go back to our mission, our mission is not going to be catering to those persons who really are delving into high power law firms and uh, actually going into um, big big firms, big big law firms. A small portion of our law students do go to large large firms, but the majority of them hang out their own shingle or go into small two to four two to four practice areas. If we look at our student population as well, our student population is 52% minority and 46% uh, Caucasian American. So you look at your total population and you look at what do they, uh, why did they come to law school and what did they come to do? What is their end, end result? Um, and you want to design your course with this in mind um, and their background in mind as well. And don't forget to focus on your curriculum. Like I know everybody's using the term word, the buzz term words like practice ready students and you know, all that other good stuff, but what really is your curriculum focusing on? Okay, so when you focus on what your curriculum really focuses on, then you want to also cater your course around that and support your curriculum. So just just like uh, Mike said, that you want to go and find that faculty member, but you can also find that faculty member that supports you, that can come into your classroom, or that can also talk about your course as well. So you want to move that. This information is definitely going to drive uh, what you teach and how you teach it. Um, and then employment. As I just indicated, the vast majority of our students go to um, small practice, two to four person uh, practice. They hang out their own shingle. They're in government agency work. They go to the AG's office, uh, public defender's office, or the attorney general's office in North Carolina. So that is really going to drive what you teach and how you teach, as I indicated. So with this in mind, you also want to develop your partnerships, okay? So I've listed the main uh, partnerships that are really key to your course. That, and you're like, what, what does this have to do with, with this course? Why are we going down this? Believe me, it's important, okay? Because career services, this is where you're going to get your employment statistics from. You're also going to strike up conversations about the types of firms that your law students are going to. They can also strike up conversations with the firms that we offer this course. Should our course, should our students be taking this course? What type of technology do you have in your law firm? We care about what you're utilizing, so we can send students that are prepared to work in your firm, and we know what you're doing. Okay, so we care about that. <laughs> Student services. So this also is your information. Where are your students coming from? What are their interests, their background information? So you want to have them pull all this information for you so that, that you can analyze and look at this. My, my BFF is the dean of students, um, not just you know, figuratively, literally. So we talk about a lot about what our students want. At North Carolina Central, the majority of our students stay in North Carolina. We have and the other ones that do not stay in North Carolina. They go to our adjacent states like Maryland, Virginia, South Carolina, and Georgia. 
So you want to keep that in mind and also take a look at what some of those other states are utilizing. Clio is really big in North Carolina, but Rocket Matter or another um, practice management software might be big in Georgia or in Maryland. So those are the things that you want to take pay attention to as well. Academic affairs. You want to make sure that academic affairs is on board. They can promote your class. They can also not put you up against the favorite professor, right? You know, <laughs> can you help me up a little bit? You know, can you not put me out at 8 o'clock in the morning? Um, when you're just a two credit hour course, they kind of stick you anywhere. Um, and you want to, in turn, be also be in the know with your academic standards and ABA regulations. You know, kudos for asking and incorporating periodic assessments throughout the course. All these good things that your academic deans want to hear and want to see that you're doing and that you care about. Okay? And then development. This is great. Okay? This is a great talking point for development. Okay? If you don't go to development uh, opportunities, feed your development officer some information. Your school is keeping pace with technology. It's a good point for alumni and prospective donors. Um, to know, sometimes prospective employ employers will um, ask their interns if they've taken this course. Um, are you interested in this course? Maybe I think you should go take this course. These are all really good partnerships to develop as you're going through and walking through this course. So I've been in touch with all these people, kind of got an idea of what I want to teach, and now I'm going to move forward. Where did I go? Can I do two slides? There we go. Okay, so now I've got to figure out really delving into what I'm teaching. So the great part about it is that there's so much information out there. There's, there's probably too much information. But the main places where we found a lot of information for teaching our course was the Teaching Technology to Law Student Special Interest Group, um, the AAAL webinars, and the ABA Legal Technology Resource Center. And big, big shout out for the ABA Legal Tech Show. Um, it was my first time going this past year. Just amazing, amazing information. So if you can go in 2018, I would highly recommend it. But all of these places, and then just start calling people. You know, I just started emailing people and calling people. Hey, do you have a syllabus? Can I look at your syllabus? And the, and the great part about it is that there's just so much out there. You'll be waiting in um, syllabi and documents to go through that it's incredible that you'll have to really comb through with everything that we've talked about to get your um, syllabi together. Um, any questions so far? We're still alive, we're still, everybody's still awake? Okay. <laughs> All right, but now you've got to take this and you've got to teach it. Okay, so this is your second review. So you're going to review all the material, you've got it all laid out for you, and this is the hard part. You've got to ask your question, can you effectively teach that topic? Because a lot of this tech stuff, like the, some of the stuff that Mike just mentioned, like, what, what, what just happened? What? <laughs> I would have to take a whole, I would have to go back to undergrad. I would have to go back and take another course. But there are some things that I can effectively teach. There are some things that I actually had no idea what I was doing, but it was great to learn about, and the learning curve wasn't that steep. Okay, so I actually sat down over a weekend and taught myself a couple of things or just really gave, um, was able to go through and learn the topic such that I could teach it or um, effectively persuade uh, the students that I knew what I was talking about. Talk to the vendors, okay? I know a lot of times we avoid vendors like the plate, but this is where we really want to talk to them. We want to get their input. We want, we want the freebies. We want our students to be able to sign up for it. Uh, we want all the access that we can get. What, do you have a training tool? You have what? Can you come? Can you, can you train my whole class for free? Can you Skype in? Can you come in? Um, what can you give us for free? Can you give us free pads? Any, any literature? All this information. And they will come and talk to your class. And so when they come and talk to your class, use those guest lectures. We incorporated guest lectures um, a quite a bit. Okay, so we, we taught what we could taught, and then we incorporated uh, vendors. And I think it was also great for the students to see um, different people. It was also great for them, um, them to know that uh, we weren't pretending that we had a knowledge set that we didn't have. 
We also uh, talked a lot, we got a lot of um, people from our community. So we actually had um, the networking person that set up my husband's computers or and set up a lot of lawyers' offices in Durham, uh, where I'm from. He came and talked to the group. He gave them basic tips on how you can set up your network, what to look for, what questions to ask. <coughs> Excuse me. And so while it wasn't expected that he was going to set up your networking system, he did give a lot of insight into what you could do. So great ways to use um, guest lecturers. <coughs> okay. All right. So I wanted to do a quick course, course comparison of um, UNC. So Stacey was, was able to give me her syllabi, and uh, I have uh, kind of compared it to our syllabi at North Carolina Central. We both did two credit hours. That was really good for us. Um, we met two days a, a, a week uh, for one hour. Um, it was effective. It wasn't too much of an overload for the students, and they really liked it. We did a lot of hands-on activity, okay? A lot of delving into this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, can you figure this out, play with this, and work, work with it. Um, we both had a final project or paper, so uh, Stacy they had a 12 to 15 page paper that she can talk a little bit more. We actually came up with a horrible law office, like, and we just did a legal tech audit. So we basically threw issues at them and had them spot, spot and develop and do a, basically like a lit review and go through all the issues that we talked about. Um, uh, they, at UNC, they also incorporated a lot of guest speakers as well. So a lot of, a lot of similarities in our, in our two courses there. Just to do, delve a little bit further, um, in the areas of focus, we did, we did heavily, we talked about this earlier in a couple other sessions, we did do the legal tech audit where they were able to give it to us for, um, for free, and so we did a, now they want us, of course, to buy it. Um, <laughs> um, so, but we only had seven, seven students at the time, so we were able to get it. So we did do the legal tech audit. Our students didn't freak out about it. We told them that it was hard. We told them it took us a long time to do, um, and we did grade them for, we did give them a grade um, for just turning it in and going through it. And we really told them that it was a learning curve, but these are things that you need to be aware of um, that you can do. We focused on a practice management. Again, we focused on Clio. We did a, a lot of a social media audit. So we had uh, someone from the Bar Association come in and talk about um, what she looked for and, and the advice that she gives uh, persons that are setting up their websites and their social media presence directly from the, the state bar. And then, like I indicated, we did a law firm technology audit. At UNC, you can see they did technology in the courtroom. They did uh, litigation support services. They did a development, a website development. I could never do that again. You see, they had that. And I guess she can tell you the pros and cons of, see, she'll give you an indication of how that went out. I, I wouldn't even, I don't even know if I want to attempt to do that. It sounds really fun. But again, my, I know where my learning curve is. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the paper. So again, a lot of similarities here um, with the with the syllabi, and then with the the assessment. Again, we did we gave them credit for the online legal tech audit. We gave them just ten percent. We did a memo where they had to use use the practice management software, and this is where we threw in a little bit of research. Okay, <coughs> so we made them go back and um, look at some basic research, but they also had to upload and to do some practice management incorporated in there. We did digital marketing assessments, we did in-class assessments, and we did a couple of presentations, and then the final big one was the 30%. So we didn't deviate too much from UNC, but again, we, we, had, we had totally different um, missions and styles, but we had very similarity very similar um, assessment um, technique. We, broke, we just broke ours out a little bit. Um, all right. So our final just end result, and because Stacey's going to talk a little bit more about her course in, in general, we developed courses for our students. Okay, and we used the techniques that I kind of just breezed over in the, in the last uh, 10 minutes. We were comfortable with our coverage um, and what we chose to do. But we, we gave our students exposure to the important technology issues that 
were relevant to, we, we uh, determined were relevant for our students and exposure to uh, the almighty, you know, all fearful World 1.1 that everyone is running away from because we don't know what the heck is going to happen or how they're going to test it. Um, so I think that gives you the overall picture of just how you can develop and, and what, what your course can look like in how you can develop that. Okay, so I think Steve's going to come and talk a little bit more about her course and the things that she learned with um, her course. All right, I really appreciate all the turnout. Um, it's Friday. It's the last. It's the last section, and I have a really good crowd here, so I really appreciate that. Um, I've been a law librarian since 2005. I taught legal research for 10 years to 1Ls. I've taught uh, transaction and business legal research, and then this last semester, I finally got a chance to teach legal technology. And I have to say, that was the most fun class I've ever taught. The students loved it. They were very receptive to it. And it was a fantastic experience. A few things that I learned from it. Oh, just in case, we do have our materials on uh, Shed, as well as we've got a Dropbox for this. So if you want our syllabi, if you want the training demos that we use, all of that is available for you. So you have kind of your starter kit to get ready. One thing I learned from this class, Dunning-Kruger is alive and well. What is Dunning-Kruger? Yeah. What is that phenomenon? Anybody know? Kind of weird. People think they know more than they really know. Exactly. So, self-selected course, mostly three L's, some two L's. Did just an informal poll. Next time I think I'll use something like um, cahoots. An informal poll. Okay, how do you guys feel? How comfortable are you with technology? These are digital natives, right? We've all heard that term. <laughs> Students that have grown up with technology. How comfortable are you? All, you know, everybody's hands goes up. This is an awesome class. We know all about it. We're going to, you know, rock the class. Okay. There are ways of testing that. One of them that we used was called Proceras. What it does is it offers modules that test knowledge of Word, Excel, PDFs, lots of other different software services just to see how well somebody does with them, basic tasks. So that's actually what we had our students doing. Again, if you're looking for it, it's right down here. We gave it out to the students. Um, we did not test, we did not say, you know, we're going to test this. We just want you to do it and complete it. You don't have a time limit. You can take as much time as you need. You can consult any source that you would like. So all of my digital natives, one of them scored as a novice. Everybody else scored as a beginner, the lowest score. So clearly, they did not know as much as they thought they knew. Worse, I kind of hope some of them, when they ran into concepts that they didn't know, would try to figure it out. Go to YouTube. Go to Linda. Go to something. Because you could take these over and over again. They didn't do that. So I think one of the most helpful things about this class is to try to figure out exactly what their knowledge base is. Design something for that. We did make a point of None of these vendors that we use, we were not personally invested in them. You know, we had to use what tools were available to us. Sometimes cost was a factor. Sometimes, as Nikki said, it's just our depth of knowledge, where we know or what we know about a particular vendor. So with that out of the way, you were able to get all kinds of stats on what the students did, what modules they took. In this case, we only did Word, Excel, and PDF. Now, Word is the one I thought they would do the most with. Excel was even worse. They know even less about Excel than Word. So that gave us kind of a platform to figure out where we needed to go with this class. Gave us a, um, at least a 
a platform to stand on. Okay, so major themes that we hit. Productivity software is where we came with Proceris. Word, Excel, PowerPoint. One of the big themes is getting automation into those boring and repetitive tasks that lawyers have all the time. So if you want to push automation, you know, we all hear the horror stories, robots are coming for our jobs. Mm -hmm. Not really. Not if you know how to harness automation, which you can do, things like hot dogs. But it goes back to the fundamentals of knowing how to use Word proficiently. So that was one of the things that we covered. Using styles. The basis of hot dogs is actually getting your um, documents in order that you can swap things around easily. With styles, I've got a basic brief here. Table of authorities is created automatically. I've got navigation over here on the side. So let's say, for whatever reason, my statute changes, and I'm looking at demonstrates reasonable minds. If you've got your documents set up, you can click on it and then reshuffle it with a couple of clicks. Everything is now reformatted. My ones are all the same. How many times have we gone into Word? You've hit tab. It went over. You started getting all this weird stuff that you couldn't control. It's because of styles. And a lot of people don't understand that, including our students. If we go back to home, See right here where it says styles? You have to know what that is. If you want the navigational panel with it, you have to know it's that little button right there to click on in order to access that. No one tells you. You have to go to specific classes for it. And it's not intuitive. And that's something our law students have learned. So I did feel really good once we got into this. One big hurdle with it? How many of your students are Mac users? A lot of Mac users, right? Can you do this ex to this extent with Office Mac? No. You do not get the full features. Doesn't matter which version you put on there. Mac is limited. So if you are looking for document automation, you're going to lose functionality. So I could look out, and it was real easy to see. I got a lot of Mac users. I've got the little Apple lit up as I'm talking to them. <laughs> so I'm lucky with UNC that we have a virtual lab. So the students were able to remote in, and then they could work in a Windows environment. So I was able to overcome that using the remote bar, uh, environment. Other areas where it was Mac versus Windows. Let me get back to my PowerPoint real quick. Case management tools. As Nikki said, our state, I'm from North Carolina, we are big Clio people. So we try to use Clio, and I was lucky that my co-instructor is a certified Clio um, consultant, so he knows the software very, very well. We were fully transparent with that. It's also the software that our clinic uses. So we were able to go through and give them a very in-depth, hands-on demonstration of Clio. Clio is cloud-based, so Mac versus Windows did not make a difference. Case map that we also did a very in-depth demonstration of, Windows only. So again, we had the Mac problem. In this case, luckily, we had loaner laptops. We went and we installed case map on all of these and then passed the loaner laptops out so that we could still have that um, instruction with case map. E-discovery. How many of you have used relativity? <coughs> this was another one. Again, we tried to pick vendors based on what we thought people would use. We put on our best crystal ball, hopefully read the tea leaves right. Relativity is through Kcura. What we did is we bought access to it. We weren't nearly as lucky with the free access that Nikki apparently was. We paid for most of it through law school funds. 
um, just so that our students would ha wouldn't have to absorb that cost. So we did pay for access to it. But relativity, remember the big Exxon scandal? Or Enron, I'm sorry, Enron out in California? That entire set of documents has been put into the public domain. Relativity has it now, so that you can actually go through and run scenarios for e-discovery through relativity. Um, I've got the full demo that we used up on the Dropbox if you want to see it. It's like 120 pages long. It took us a couple of weeks to get through it, but they got hands-on real experience using e-discovery. And again, we tried to present all of these exercises as good things you can actually put on your resume. I mean, yes, the days are over that you have 16 boxes of physical discovery and, you know, 30 different associates going through and looking through it. Right. Now it's all condensed down into one. But do you have the skills in e-discovery that you can go through, weed out, you know, several hundred thousand emails that say, thanks, let's go meet coffee or let's go have coffee that mean nothing and actually get to the emails that might provide a basis for your case. That is the skills you're developing with something like relativity. And I was very happy our students were able to look at that. So those were the main areas that we covered. As far as assignments went, again, we were lucky at UNC. What we had the students do for web development, I mean, likely, since they are going to practice with smaller clinics, we don't have a whole lot of students that go on to big law. There's some, but the vast majority, like Nikki said, go on to two or three person firms. So it's likely they will be at least running or in charge of their own websites. Well, at UNC, we have the infrastructure in place of WordPress. We didn't have to do anything. The students already have access to it. We didn't have to worry about security or setting it up or anything like that since it's already in place. So the students could actually go in as a group. They could put us on as administrators so we could go in and look and see what they did. And then they could actually create these websites. It just gave them experience of having their hands in the actual content management system. They didn't have to know code. Most of it was WYSIWYG. A few of them really impressed us and actually went ahead and put their own cascading style sheets in, and they did a really good job on it. I was very impressed. But again, we made it clear that they did not have to be coders. Doug and I felt very comfortable <coughs> doing that since we both have web development experience. But again, it goes back to what Nikki said. If you don't have that, and if you don't think your students will use it, you don't have to do that. But in our case, what we had them do was go out and look at other firms that are local to the area. And they found firms that their websites need help. The 1990s called and would like their website back. And we presented that as a, web, as a, a job opportunity. I mean, that is something, again, you can put on your resume and say, hey, I've got at least some web, um, web management experience with WordPress. So that was how we presented all these. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes left for questions. Just show of hands, who is actually teaching a technology class now? Okay, and who would like to? Okay, so that was kind of the audience that we were going for, was giving you a kit, giving you just examples of what we've used, and I think worked pretty well to get you started. So what else would you like to know? I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I feel like um, we could spend a month on Word and Adobe alone. So uh, I'm sort of curious with those particular products, because they use technical in school as well as practice. Um, do you find yourself spending more time on that? Yeah, I mean, there was a lack of fundamentals. I'm just curious, like how you balance the time you spend on the different tools that you're teaching. We moved on. We we showed them their deficiencies um, by using you know legal technology for services and product. You know, which takes you through 
the module, and it's basically this is your deficiency. If you know you can't do it, then it's almost like anything else in law school. You have to you have to work at it. I'm sorry, I'm saying yeah. Um, you have to work at it, and you have to develop it. We show you your deficiency. This is something that it would behoove you to take a look at and to master before you um, graduate, or you know that this is your weakness. I think that's just what we did. Yeah, and so you spent your time identifying what the deficiencies were, and then um, it's up to them to fix the problem. Exactly. Okay. The module do show them great ways to, to identify and address and how they should you know, go about and exercise, but really it's up to them um, to identify. Well, did we you find that they followed up, though? I, I don't think, I know they didn't follow up because in our, in our next assignment, uh, so we purposely put, uh, uh, had them turn in assignments in Word, and we would check their, uh, check their files, and they, they got dinged because they weren't using the fundamentals that, that we taught them. So we took off points because we had gone over this. Uh, this is something that you, this is a skill set you, you need to be developing. Um, and so that was one of our rubric as well. Yeah, and that was something we failed to say explicitly. You must use the aisles on the on the uh, research paper at the end, and they did not. Use them. They did put in, you know, the fonts and things. We just had them use the North Carolina rules of court. That was the basic, you know, rules for the paper. Um, so they had that to follow, but a lot of them just did it by hand. I mean, a lot of times they just treat Word like a typewriter. Right. But they go back. They revert back to their old haunts um, because if they for them, it's easier. Um, so I'd say it's important to actually put that in there explicitly, right. what skills you're trying to make sure that they master and make sure that they show up on those assignments. Did any of the faculty for like seminar classes where they have to do papers or any kind of like practical drafting class where like those skills might come in handy? Either use that as a prerequisite or like say if you took this class, like you know, put in those expectations too? I know that they did it in the first year class. Mm -hmm but I don't know if that carried over all the way to the third year class. And a lot of ours were already third years, so I didn't have that opportunity to follow up and just see. So we're going to work with our appellate advocacy prep, uh, professors and purchase licenses for them, um, for our, those students in our appellate advocacy classes, and work with the professors to engage them in uh, using that next year. I was just wondering if you could go back to the slide that had your Dropbox URL on it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, perfect. And those are also up on schedule as well, yeah. too. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm wondering, this, this strikes me a little bit of the, the, the problem that we had years and years ago of teaching legal research, you know, the bibliographic approach versus the process-oriented approach. And I worry, with tech, I worry with law office technology, it's that same sort of issue. Like, if there's not a context within which you're showing how to, like, you could spend time, here's how this works, here's how you do it, but if there's not some sort of project associated with it, if they don't see it within, within, a, within a, a, a process, like, is it just that, you know, the, what we used to do when it was those, you know, the Easter egg hunts to find the research things that they needed, and I wonder, have you tried to integrate it more where it's, it is really this experiential kind of learning that they are, like, you mentioned final papers, the products that they're doing, so, there's a context in which it sticks, as opposed to, like, I've learned how to do a web page three times, and I never then really did it, and so I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Right, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know how one really gets that so that they really get it and they can actually use it. And that's what we're still refining on, honestly. I mean, I made some mistakes with assigning the research paper because I didn't highlight some of those things that should have shown up there, like styles. Um, this is the first time that I've taught it, so I'm hoping I can catch more of those problems in the next class, which will be in two years, so 2019. So, but yeah, it's definitely, it's a learning experience, both for them and for us. Yeah, I think the only thing that you can try and do is incorporate it more in your clinical, in your clinical education program as well. Like, partner with your clinic and, and show your clinic these tools as well. I think the overall... Uh, point of what we did at North Carolina Central, this was a, a survey course pretty much that provided you with tools and basic information that you could utilize and should utilize um, to, like we had students that were working for currently in, in, in an internship with these firms and they took that, a couple of times they took back the information that was in their class to their employers 
and they adopted some of the, the techniques or some of the things that we um, brought up in class. I thought that was great. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I didn't listen to the question. Yeah. Oh, ours was actually use of courtroom technology. Um, they were all they were broken up into groups, about three groups each. Uh, they were given an appellate case, and they had to actually come in and represent the case and use the courtroom technology to do so. So, I mean, we actually have you know the jury box and everything set up for them. That was the classroom that we taught in, and that was the requirement: come in and use the technology. So they were allowed some creative license with it. They didn't have to stay exactly with the facts as given. But, you know, they had to come up. They had to present evidence. You know, they had to use the technology to, um, for that particular assignment. Yeah, I don't want to steal that idea. Ours was basically on apps. So we did a lot of apps. So they had to utilize the app, how they, you know, and give reference points to it and demonstrate it to our class. We had oh, I was just going to say, I think clinics are a great idea, but um, getting into the doctrinal courses, I mean, it's, it's a stretch, but finding ways that you can connect, say, document assembly to right. contracts course. Exactly. Right. And I, I forget discovery, there's no course, but some of the data. Like, they did basically offer to do a guest lecture in a course and show them Mad Libs and then realize that Mad Libs is document assembly. And <laughs> <laughs> No, that's great. Good. That's great. Yeah, great outreach to the faculty too. I mean, that goes back to Michael's point of getting in that buy-in. Anybody else? Yes, so, uh, <clears throat> Prestier just uh, is a paid platform. Yes. Yeah. 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 We had people who said the law school paid for it. Right. How long of a trial? How long of a usage period for your students? Um, we got it for the whole semester. Okay. So as we were going through and doing other concepts, I would repeatedly send them back. Um, at the very beginning of the semester, I had them do all of that. And then when we were covering more things, like when we got into redaction and getting rid of metadata, right. which was completely new to most of the class, that was a little frightening when we got into e-filing, you know, and leaving that bread trail through your other documents. That was well, another one that I sent back for PDFs. Well, the question that was asked before about the, <coughs> uh, sorry, the negative feedback that they may have gotten because they got such poor grades. I mean, there is a, a video module in Persistence which gives you uh, the right way to do it. Yes. Yeah. Right. But you have to do it first before you, have you to see You have to do it that. first yeah. before you can see the video. Right. 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 So there is, a, there is kind of a... What I'm, what I'm getting at is there is, is there a hope for, is there a solution uh, rather than just telling people you got it wrong, you know, it's, go hang your head. <laughs> yeah, and some of it is hard. I mean, I tried some of the more expert ones and I failed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'll freely admit that. Yeah. And, but and it does show you. I'm sorry. Yeah, and we told our students that. You know, we told our students that we had trouble with some of these concepts as well. Um, well, especially the Excel. Right. The Excels are really. But I thought that's what I really liked about the Procerta stuff, is once you got it wrong, you could go back and see how it was done correctly, what the solution was. Right. Now, you do get into problems. There's different ways to do it on Mac. There's different ways to do it on Word. Right. And it's different between, like, 2016, 2013, 2010. Right. So that's its own set of problems. Vicki? Um, this doesn't really so much apply to Nikki, I don't think. I'm wondering if you had any difficulty getting this through your film committee for approval? Unfortunately, I was not here. Um, it didn't sound like it. This class was originally taught in 2015. And Steve taught, yeah. Yeah, Steve and Doug taught, taught it. And it sounded like, I mean, it was Doug's idea that it went through fairly easily. But unfortunately, I wasn't there for it. Doug Edmonds? Doug yes. Edmonds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he spoke about he spoke about it in fact at this at this at this conference a couple of years ago. Yeah, but I don't, I don't so think that so. video is up. Yeah. <laughs> we we um, I used to, I was at USC for a brief period of time, so I know and we're right down the road. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Thank you so much. Signals the end of the conference. <laughs> 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 and the berries still have to go. Oh, it's not over. <laughs>
the end of the, the, end of the 